Next on PIJN News, Dr. Chaps reports on these important issues. Maryland votes to give $2 million to Planned Parenthood if Trump defunds them. Indiana's Senate tries to bypass a judicial ruling on abortion. We interview Roberts Lairdon, pastor and author. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt, Dr. Chaps, and you're watching PIJN News. On this show, we like to do three things. We report the news, we discern the spirits, and we pray the scriptures in Jesus' name. Are you ready to pray the news with us? Here's our first story. The state of Maryland has now voted and has approved funding for an extra $2 million in taxpayer subsidies to the abortion giant Planned Parenthood. That is on the condition that President Trump defunds Planned Parenthood in Maryland and withdraws the federal tax dollars that are already going to help kill children. LifeSite News and Peter LaBarbera report that Maryland Governor Larry Hogan allowed a bill to become a law on April 6th that will provide $2.7 million in state money to Planned Parenthood if Congress and President Trump cut off the federal tax funding to that abortion corporation. The Maryland bill, SB 1801, was one of 15 that became law without the governor's signature in the deep blue state of Maryland, heavily Democratic, but also a Catholic state by tradition. Maryland's Catholic Conference, MCC, made headlines last month by stating that it would not oppose providing of tax financing of Planned Parenthood. Well, that's not a Catholic position. They should oppose it. But they argued that government funds under the bill could not be used to pay for abortions. Although money is fungible and it is being used to pay for abortions. The Baltimore Sun, for example, reported that, quote, Governor Hogan's decision to avoid most of his possible veto fights this year is a concession to the political reality that Democrats hold super majorities in both the House and Senate in Maryland and can override his vetoes anytime they remain united. The bill uh, that Hogan did veto limits education reforms that he favors. And that bill, the Protect Our Schools Act, became law anyway, Thursday, through a quick party line vote to override his veto, which passed 90 to 50 in the Maryland House and 32 to 15 in the Senate, according to the Baltimore Sun. Last month, HB 1083, the Maryland House version of SB 1081, passed 90 to 54, so a successful veto override of the governor's attempt to stop Planned Parenthood funding was likely, especially with organized Catholic opposition now being neutered because MCC, the Catholic group, opted out of what has become the defining battle among pro-life activists nationwide. Maryland now becomes the first legislature in the nation to pass a bill providing state funding to Planned Parenthood if the federal Congress should defund the abortion giant. And at the federal level, Congress is poised to defund Planned Parenthood, but pro-life advocates around the country are anxious that it has not yet done so with pro-life Republicans controlling both the executive and legislative branches in DC. And that's the news. Our thanks to Peter LaBarbera and LifeSiteNews.com for that report. Let's take a moment and discern the spirits. There is a demonic spirit of murder that is funding abortion nationwide. And it's not just in the abortion doctors who have the scalpel. It's not just in the pregnant mother who decides unfortunately to kill her own child. It is actually also now in the Maryland legislature. And when, when the governor won't veto, when the Catholics won't put up a fight, evil is running amok to slaughter wholesale with your tax dollars, the children of the state of Maryland, and nobody thinks there's a problem with this. 
I think it's demonic. And the Bible says so in Isaiah chapter 59, their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, demonic thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. Let's pray about this. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we pray against this demonic spirit of slaughter and murder that would betray and kill the innocent children of Maryland. And Lord, it's not their fault. They're born into that state. They don't even know it's coming. And suddenly the scalpel funded by the taxpayers. And what a tragedy, what an evil. Father, we pray for an end to the evil in that state. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a short break. When we come back, Indiana is fighting back against a judicial abortion decision. Giving you a megaphone in Washington, D.C. Dr. Chaps will be right back. Take action today. Dr. Chaps needs you to sign an important online petition. Today, I want to invite you to sign a critical petition to defend innocent babies and to end abortion in America. On this show, we like to pray and petition God. But we also need you to take action today by petitioning Congress to stop the taxpayer-funded child killing, especially by defunding Planned Parenthood, America's number one abortion provider. Why are your taxes paying to murder innocent children in the womb? Well, if Congress would simply define personhood as life beginning at conception, we can reverse Roe versus Wade. Please join me today by signing this important petition to Congress. Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org and sign your petition today. Sign today's petition right now. Again, visit PrayInJesusName.org to sign our petition right now. He is the intersection of church and state. Here is Dr. Chaps. Thank you for watching, I'm Dr. Chaps. Associated Press reports that Indiana and their state Senate are now trying to bypass a judicial ruling on abortion. The Indiana Senate sent to Governor Eric Holcomb a measure last Wednesday that would make it tougher for a minor to have an abortion without her parents knowing about it beforehand. After legislators changed the wording to leave open the possibility that the procedure could still be kept private under some circumstances. Under Indiana law, girls younger than 18 must either get their parents' consent to have an abortion or seek permission from a judge. And that bill would require, uh, by the way, the senators approved 38 to 10, a final vote, that would require the judge consider the request, but also to weigh whether or not the parent, girl's parents should be notified by the judge of her pursuit of the so-called judicial bypass, regardless of the decision on the abortion itself. The new Republican governor has not yet taken a position on it, but spokeswoman Stephanie Wilson wrote in an email that the bill is not on the governor's agenda for the session and declined to comment further. Aside from noting that he'll quote, consider it carefully before making his final decision, end quote. By the way, a federal judge last month blocked a separate Indiana mandate forcing women to undergo an ultrasound at at least 18 hours before having an abortion. And that's the news. Our thanks to Associated Press for that report. So let me get this straight. A girl is going to kill her child and she, she's under 18, she's a min minor. She's still living presumably at her parents' house and she doesn't have to tell mom and dad that she's about to kill their grandchild. So she goes to a judge, and right now the judge is not allowed to pick up the phone and call mom and dad. The judge can't even consider whether or not he should notify the parents under current law. Well, of course this bill ought to pass. Of course the judge ought to have the option of considering whether or not to pick up the phone and call mom and dad. And if that accountability were provided, maybe there would be some changes of hearts. Maybe these girls would not be killing their child in that way. That child is a human being. As God determined in the Bible, when Psalm 139 was written, I will praise you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows that very well. 
Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll have an interview with Robert Slairdon. Giving you a megaphone in Washington, D.C. Dr. Chaps will be right back. Did you know religious freedom is under fire in our military today? Our troops do not have protection. For example, military chapels are now being desecrated by homosexual wedding ceremonies on bases in all 50 states. Our troops are now also face punishment if they dare to object to sharing common sleeping quarters or common shower facilities, or if chaplains dare to quote the Bible during private counseling that declares that homosexuality is a sin. Nobody in our military should be forced to violate their Christian conscience, especially their right to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Let's take action today for religious freedom. Would you sign a petition with me? Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org. Let's defend religious freedom for our troops. Take action today. Dr. Chaps needs you to sign today's petition right now. Again, visit PrayInJesusName.org to sign our petition right now. Defending your religious freedom, here is Dr. Chaps. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps. We're here at Proclaim 17, the NRB convention in Orlando, Florida, where I've just been joined by Roberts Lairdon, who is an internationally best-selling author, evangelist, missionary. He is starting a new church here in Orlando, Florida. Roberts, welcome to the program. Good to be with you. So what's the name of your new church? Tell called us. called Embassy International Church. So we call it after an embassy because we're God's people on the earth and we want an international and all people to be welcome. And we're actually proud to be a church. It's not a, a club or a fellowship or a church, okay? <laughs> yes, and you've had some experience. You've founded churches or sent missionaries all over the world. Yes, we in our first church that I built in California, we called it Embassy Christian Center in those days. We uh, grew to about 2,000 and we sent 500 missionary families out that we trained and funded to all parts of the world, mainly where the gospel was little or non-existent. I wanted them to go and push and help there, so we kind of helped pick where they went for at least a year. Some stayed longer, but we asked them to go for a year and to do the gospel first, humanitarian things second, and to either build a church or help what's there. And so we had a great time doing that. To me, that's what being a prosperous guy is all about, is being able to fund the gospel and help people do what their calling is. And so we plan to do that again. But this time in the church here, we'll still send some overseas, but I think God's got my heart to help the spirit-filled community and the churches here in America. Uh, it's almost like America's become a mission field in a way. And so the Lord sent me home from England. I was living there for five years and said, go back home and treat America like a mission field. And so that's kind of the nature that I'm coming back with to help raise up and assist churches that are out there or go into communities where there's not a good, healthy church and build a new one and act like we're on the African or the Asian or some other mission field. And a mission field is not just two things. It's not just the need of the gospel and humanitarian. It is defined by one thing, the need of the gospel. And America and Europe needs the gospel. Our hotels are great, our cars work, our food is wonderful, but our gospel is little or becoming very powerless. So I want to try to help turn that a little bit. And it's interesting, you spent so much time overseas that now you began to look at America as a, an unevangelized mission field. Mm. Uh, do we not have enough gospel here in America or is, or is there always room for more Jesus? I think there's room for more Jesus, especially in some of our communities. I think we've got, we, we assume our cameras and our radios, and I appreciate all of them, do all the work for us. But we still need to do things on a local level, a community level, and that's where we're going to get most of the evangeliz evangelization done. And that's where the need is at, I think, the strongest, in my opinion. And now, you've also been a best-selling author. Hmm. 15 million copies of books that you have written are now in circulation, if I read that right. And this is your latest one, that's God's latest one. God's Generals, Martyrs. Now, yes. this is volume six out of 12 that are upcoming, but what is Martyrs about? Well, this came about when I was watching television a few years ago, and the ISIS people were beheading Coptic Christians in Libya. And uh, I mean, we all saw the orange jumpsuits. I think the whole world saw those pictures. And I was so moved by, I thought we're back in near, we're back in, you know, ancient times of beheadings and crucifixions. And it provoked me to go back to tell the stories of people from the Bible days to today. I included in this book, women that were martyrs and children that were martyrs and whole families that were martyrs. That's why this book's a little different because I thought children were beheaded and they were killed throughout time too for their faith. And they didn't deny the Lord. 
they should be honored. And so I wanted to bring all those to a awareness so that we could be inspired to be more vocal and bold where we live. Now, Fox's Book of Martyrs may, the best. <laughs> may have been, you know, one of the original yes. early church history books about the the deaths and the slaughter of particular Christians who were listed and be what does the word martyr mean? Isn't that from the Greek word which means witness? It began in its original word as a witness and but then over time it began to change to those who have suffered for their faith and where today it means those who have died for their faith or have been injured or imprisoned for their faith. So the word keeps evolving. And so in the beginning, that was the correct definition. But as time passed, it became, when we say martyrs, someone who was crucified or who died for their faith. There are more people being killed for their Christian faith today than it was in the time of Nero, is what they told. 90,000 recorded deaths last year of Christians that we know about. But that number, if we include the way they understand it today, when they teach it today, it's deaths, it's imprisonments and it's maiming or some type of disabling uh, of your faith. They call that a martyr. So it's almost going through a new definitional structure again. So um, it, we, we are suffering for our faith as Christians today. And we need to pray for people, help people out. And may America and the Western nations still allow these people to come to our country to be safe and to serve God in a free way. And this book that you've written, God's Generals, Martyrs, this is the, the volume about martyrs. It has chapters in here about the Apostle Stephen, the first martyr of the early church in Acts chapter 7, uh, the ISIS victims who were beheaded on that beach, just like you said, but also men of history like William Tyndale and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Perpetua and Felicity, a couple names that people may not recognize. We, we try to include people that we know and folks we did not know. Like there's one lady that uh, I write about was that she was pregnant when they caught her being a Christian back in ancient times. And the emperor allowed her to give birth to her baby and to wean the baby and then killed her. And so the family, her mother and dad, kept coming to her over this whole period of months and almost a little over a year saying, give up your faith, give your faith. But this woman kept her faith in Christ, even though all of this was going on. And to me, that's an amazing story that someone could give birth to your baby, wean your baby, knowing at the end of this process, you're going to die. And then they have a great story about how she gave her child over to her family and asked them to raise it in the Christian way of life and took her out to the big Colosseum in that town and was killed by the animals. Just a horrific tragedy, yeah. and yet it's a testament of her boldness and her faith, unwilling to forsake Christ even though she faced a certain death. Yeah, those people have a certain degree of temperature or stamina that we need today just to be a witness to those around about us in our culture. I mean, we're scared to say to somebody at the dinner table, can I talk to you about Jesus because it may offend them or something. These people lost their life because they would not deny the Lord. So hopefully this book and their stories will make us speak up a little bit more is my goal. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, I'm going to ask Robert Slairdon about the other five volumes of God's Generals. Dr. Chaps will be right back with more PIJN News. Take action today. Dr. Chaps needs you to sign an important online petition. Today I want to invite you to sign an important petition to Congress to protect military chaplains, especially their right to pray publicly in Jesus' name. If you remember my story, you know that I was vindicated by Congress in 2006 after I took a principled stand for the right to pray in Jesus' name. I even demanded my own misdemeanor court-martial, and finally Congress agreed with me and reversed the bad Navy policy. But Congress never did pass a positive law to let chaplains pray according to their conscience. Let's take action today for religious freedom. Would you sign that petition with me? Visit PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org. Please visit PrayInJesusName.org and sign today's petition right now. Again, visit PrayInJesusName.org to sign our petition right now. Empowering you, the grassroots activist. Here is Dr. Chaps. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps. Robert Slairdon has written six volumes of this ongoing series. He predicts there will be 12 by the time he's done, Lord willing. Amen. God's Generals is the series. This book is about martyrs, but what were the previous five episodes? Well, the first one was uh, about 12 Pentecostal leaders like Catherine Kuhlman, Smith Wigglesworth, Daddy Seymour. I wrote about that particular group. The next was the Reformers, where I talked about Martin Luther, John Huss, and uh, Calvin, and these type of people. Because if they didn't do what 
what they did, we wouldn't be here today. So thank God for those guys. And then I wrote about a group called Revivalist. I called them for it because the broad name, John Wesley, George Whitfield, Finney, these, these type of people in that time period. And then I wrote about those, called, I called them the healing evangelists, like Or Roberts, Lester Simmerall, everyone that seemed to have a certain type of heart for sick people to pray for them to be healed. And I highlighted that, uh, their lives and their ministry. These books that I write about, I tell you their story, what they did good, if they made a mistake, what it was, so we can learn from it without being judgmental. So if they did something crazy, which here's my great comment, everybody great has done something stupid. So that's why there's hope for Put me at the top you of that list. Everybody right watching, there. okay? <laughs> so sometimes we think if you make a mistake, it's over. Maybe it's over with a few people and it's sad, but God's a God of a second chance. And sometimes, well, he'll give you 10,000 chances. My advice is don't use them all up, but he'll give you a second, third chance so you can learn from your mistakes and not yeah. repeat them and then go forward. And so I try to be an honest historian. Everybody I write about, I like. So I'm not trying to jab or hit, but I want to tell you the story. And people ask, well, why do you tell the bad stuff? Well, it's not bad stuff, it's life lessons to me. Yeah. In the Bible, you had David, the great king, the national hero that killed Goliath in one chapter. He lies, commits adultery and murder and still ends up a good life in the end. So if nobody I know has done that yet, David still kind of holds the top of that. So I want people to learn that these God used these people, he can use us what he did through them, he can do through us, and even something greater and different and more culturally sensitive if we're willing to be that person that gets up and says, I'm willing to go. So you talk about the revivalists, the healing evangelists, mm -hmm. the, the, the reformers. You, you kind of impressed me as one of those people. Although you're just writing about them, you've also been through some up to, ups and downs in life. Oh, I've been uh, through ups and downs, known and unknown. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> so uh, so when I say second chance, I'm living a second chance. So God's well, talk about that for a second. How has God redeemed you from one of your well, I've failings? I've made some mistakes in my life where I, my church out in California did not work. I blew it up. I can't even blame the church members or the devil. I did it. Yeah. And so I had to learn the lessons of how to accept God's forgiveness and the kindness of Christian people people. And uh, God's people have been very kind to me and they've given me a second chance and they've loved me and prayed for me. And so I've been in ministry for 30 years and uh, 127 nations. And so uh, I have to say I'm very humbled and I'm thankful to God and to them for giving me a second chance. So if they did it for me, they'll do it for anybody watching. If you'll just get up and realize God will give you a second chance. There's some people who will never give you one. Bless them and go. Here's how the Lord said it to me. I was crying one day on my life's a mess. I've screwed it up, da, da, da. And he asked me a question, how many people are in the world? I said about seven billion. He goes, quit crying over these 200 and go meet the rest of them. And as rude as that was, it healed my heart and gave me the ability to release them to him and to go forward and finish what I'm called to do. And I don't have to fix everything. I have to give it to God to fix what I cannot fix. And sometimes there are people watching that they're in a prison that God didn't put them in. If you just give that to the Lord, learn the lessons so you don't repeat the problems, he'll give you a second chance. And most Christians, 98% of them, are willing to run with you again. Well, that's kind of what our faith is about. We're not perfect people. In fact, Jesus came to redeem the flawed yeah. and to give us second chances. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're saying that. Yeah. I, I don't, you probably don't remember this, but I think I saw you preach about 30 years ago in Fort okay. Worth, Texas. Wow. I know you're out of the Tulsa movement and many yeah. of those healing evangelists, yeah. uh, Dr. Hagen, Dr. Uh, yeah. Copeland, good, good uh, you know, and, and Oral Roberts. Just that movement has transformed America and it had worldwide con consequences, e even beyond just the Azusa Street Revival. Yeah. One historian said that they recorded approximately 60 million new converts into the Christian faith worldwide because of that revival that been about 10, 12 years. So when you say it was a worldwide, it, it, if, that tr if that statement is true, let's just say that 30, that's still a lot of people that that movement brought into the kingdom. And so, and out of then, Tulsa, out of the, the what they call the Word of Faith revival, the guys you just mentioned. Yeah. So that was a lot of people they brought into salvation, and then other things as well. So it's a great move. I want to write about those guys too in one of my new books. And out of Azusa Street uh, in the early 1906, 1907, mm. the Seymour revival, yeah, yeah. Uh, even following Charles Parham from 1901, 800 million. Mm -hmm. Pentecostals or Charismatics globally. And he was an African American man in the time when Jim Crow laws controlled this country and God used him to birth and pastor the first Pentecostal thrust. It's a wonderful story. I can, yes. almost, I can almost go live on that one just because ah! <laughs> it's one of those things he should not have made it. Yeah. He was the wrong color, uneducated at a time in our American culture where those people were the lowest and God took the last and made them first. 
and it's this little and he was blind in one eye and he had a little beard because he had smallpox when he was younger and scars all over his face yeah. and uh, God used him to birth that great Azusa Street mission which all of us happy clappy you know tongue talker people comes from that heritage yeah and I love it oh it does and, and I earned my PhD later at Regent University oh. well then you know all about and it. so we have written histories all about the Pentecostal and, and yeah. charismatic movements we are the largest Protestant group in the world today all of the happy clappy tongue talking people that well, I say that because people make fun of us that way, but outside the Catholics, this is the largest Protestant group in the world. Yeah, and, and I know a lot say of Catholics you, who say, speak in tongues, too. Say what too. you want. It's grown, and it's not going away yet. The Catholic charismatic movement's huge. Yeah. So it's the Holy Spirit. So he goes everywhere. And you are writing honest biographies, not hagiographies that are dishonest, but <laughs> yeah. honest biographies about God's generals. It's now a six-part series. Uh, Roberts, I'm so honored to meet you. What's your website? Where can people find you? It's my name, robertslairden.com, or my Facebook page, Roberts Lairden Official. There's fake ones out there, so make sure it says official, okay? <laughs> and that's it. And I'm based here in Orlando, Florida, so they can call and get us that way as well. Thank you for this Thank time. You for having me. Nice to meet you. I'm Dr. Chaps. We'll be right back. Dr. Chaps will be right back with more PIJN News. Do you ever wonder how to discern your own thoughts from the thoughts that come to you from the Holy Spirit or angels or invisible demons? I'm Dr. Chaps and you've seen us talk about the gift of discerning of spirits. In fact, I wrote my PhD dissertation, How to See the Holy Spirit, Angels and Demons. But now we have an exciting 17 part video Bible study on a four disc DVD set that you can get for your small group or your church. If you just visit PrayInJesusName.org and offer a suggested donation of $99 or call us toll free at 866-ObeyGod, get this 17 part video series and for a limited time only, we'll throw in the book for free. Visit PrayInJesusName.org, get this important Bible study series for you and your church or call us at 866-ObeyGod. Stay tuned for the end of our show to learn how to partner with this ministry. Here's Dr. Chaps. Our thanks to Robert Slairdon for that interview. We need your donations to stay on the air. Would you please call us at, first, uh, at uh, 866-ObeyGod? That's our prayer line. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 29, then the people rejoiced for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. God bless you in Jesus name. We'll see you next time. Today, I wanna to invite you to sign an important petition to Congress to protect military chaplains, especially their right to pray publicly in Jesus name. If you remember my story, you know that I was vindicated by Congress in 2006 after I took a principled stand for the right to pray in Jesus name. But Congress never did pass a positive law to let chaplains pray according to their conscience. Would you sign that petition with me? Let's take action today. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-ObeyGod. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.